Hey guys, happy Sunday. It's a weird Sunday in Toronto. Um, we're going back into lockdown as of tomorrow and it's um, snowing today. Pretty big time snowing. So winter is here in both senses. Um, hey, whatever. It, it is what it is, right? Well, we'll get through this. We know there's good days ahead. Um, and until that time, we can learn and grow. And so let's, let's kind of get back to that. Alrighty. Um, you know, one of the tricky things about uh, teaching memory when you when, you know, I've studied it for so long is there's so much I want to tell you. Uh, and I'm worried this might be a little bit of a long lecture again, I'm going to try to keep it uh, reasonably under control, but I think it'll be a fun lecture as well. Uh, I'm going to start right here. And, and what I'm going to ask you to do is do not take a picture of these. Um, or if you do, at least promise not to look at them until I tell you it's good to. Um, but read these words. And um, it's gonna, I'm gonna do a little memory test on you later. So just using your mind, using your working memory, using your phonological loop and your visual spatial scratch pad, do what you can to transfer these items to long-term memory. Look at this, look at us talking geeky now. <laughs> I'll give you a few minutes to do that. I suppose you could always pause too. All right, if you want more time, um, okay, cool. I'm moving on. So remember this. So I'm going to try to connect up some things. It's one of the things I like to do in my lectures. So remember when we were talking about perception and I introduced that to you through this um, quote from the Dan Brown book that's basically saying, hey, you know, when you think of the task our brain has, there's all this information coming at it all the time. Um, and it has to somehow make sense of all this frenetic chaos. Uh, and the claim was, if you could look at the core thing the brain spends most of its time doing, you could capture it with a phrase like this, despise chaos, create order. So we talked about how the brain was really good at taking noisy input, and we were talking perception then, but making sense out of it, right? So remember things like this. Um, I asked you who this was. Um, again, for some of you guys, this might be very tricky because you might not know this individual. She's an older, so this is Judge Judy. Uh, my dad knew Judge Judy very well. Um, but you can, even though there's all this crap over top of what you're seeing there, you can very easily extract the scene, right? You see a person, even if you don't know who it is, if you don't recognize her, you see a person sitting in a chair behind a desk with flags behind them. One of them being the U.S. flag. Actually, I'm not sure what's what's on. I'm not sure what this is over here. I assumed it's a flag, but it's something. Um, but your your brain can pick out that. Now it does it sometimes though by by assuming things, right? So there's a bunch of mess here, and it's assuming well this head continues underneath that line, um, and the body continues, and so it makes it, it's it's literally changing the input. Uh, to make sense of it. We also said, you know, things like this, remember, um, when I ask, what do you see? Most people say they see this white triangle that's kind of sitting on top of another triangle that has an outline and three circles. So it's like there's three circles in a triangle and then we stuck this sort of white triangle, this one, over top of them. Um, but this one really doesn't exist at all. There's just these three greater than or less than signs, three Pac-Men. But again, our, when our brain is dealing with the input from the world, it, it, well, it makes sense of it. And what we mean by making sense of it is it connects it with things it's seen before. We see this as a person behind a desk with flags in a chair because we've seen that, that kind of scene before. So that would make sense. And we've seen a lot of triangles and things. We haven't seen so many Pac-Men and greater than or less than signs in weird ways. So we see it as, as the common thing. Okay, that's going to be a theme um, that I'm going to bring back. Um, right. And so the, what we, you know, the core thing we said there is that the brain, brain will assume information, change information, you know, do all sorts of things to make what it's seeing make sense. And by make sense, we mean um, past experience fits with things you've seen or done or felt in the past. Okay, now this should start to feel like memory, right? But what I'm going to tell you now is that memory works in the same way. So let's get there. And by memory now, let me just be clear. 
What we're talking about in this section is what in that other tree, and I should have done that a little better, uh, we would think of as episodic memories. That's what we're going to go to now, this, this, this reliving things in our mind. Okay, so that's, you know, the most colloquial use of the word memory. So that was, you know, part of the long-term memory system. What we're, what we're going to be, what we were focusing on, sorry, I'm just trying to walk you through, when we were talking the Dan Brown stuff in perception, that was things going on here, right? So just to get your head straight, this is input from the external world. And so it was coming in maybe into a sensory buffer. Um, and then somewhere in this pathway, that information was being cleaned up by top-down processes. Remember these terms? Uh, and so we, what we ended up seeing in our mind, in short-term memory, um, was the product of that, the combination of what was really coming in and these processes that made sense of what was coming in. Okay, right? Now we're going to look at a different way information gets in to our conscious memory, and that's through retrieval from long-term memory. So rather than the world giving us some information that fills our mind, our long-term memory system is going to give us information that fills our mind. But what you'll see is that the same rules apply. The information we have stored is very noisy. Um, it's not all there. Um, there's bits and pieces and whatever, but we have these processes that make sense of it and in fact reconstruct it. And that's what we end up seeing in our mind. So really just the same way, noisy input that, that top-down processes make sense of noisy input that top-down processes make sense of. So I want you to see that parallel as we as we talk about memory and as the textbook talks about memory. Textbook doesn't connect those two things up and I think they're important. Okay? Cuz we're I mean they're important because you're seeing that the brain is relying on certain principles and certain processes to accomplish a lot. And when you understand those core basic processes like the making sense process, you're understanding a lot of how the brain works is our goal here, right? Okay, cool. So now let's really get into this. We're going to think about this, this, this thing. And again, this is where we're talking about sort of conscious episodic memories. When we pull information out of long-term memory and into working memory, I'm hoping you're now starting to get comfortable with this. That's what we mean by if I said, hey, remember when we went um, scuba diving in Jamaica? You use that cue, you pull that information out of long-term memory, and you have an episode in your mind of scuba diving in Cuba, right? And that's happening in your working memory. I'm going to continue to talk geek to you <laughs> as we go through here, um, uh, because I want you to start to get used to this terminology and how, how it's used now that you know it. You can think in these ways, which is really cool. Okay. Um, what am I doing here? Yes. Okay. So we're there already. Excellent. So I don't know. We'll see how well this works. But first I want to introduce you to something called a recognition test. And I don't know why I show you eight here, but I do. So remember you saw a bunch of words earlier. Um, I could show you words like this and I could say um, for each of these words, some of them were on that list that you saw. And some of them were not. And so what I want you to do is say whether you think that word was on the list or not. We call this old new recognition. Can you recognize if a word is old? That means repeated or new first time it's presented to you. Um, and so we're going to do this and we're going to do this with these four items. Uh, in fact, in the questions below, I would like you to do each of these questions. I'm not sure how, so, so yeah, let me walk you through this. There's going to be four questions below. One for each of these words in this order, watch, candle, bed, needle. And for each, I'm going to ask you to, there will be no right answers to these questions. Okay, they will not be scored for right or wrong. Cool, all right. But for each, I'm going to ask you to give me a, a, a number between one and seven. And I want that number to reflect your judgment about whether it was old or new, but also your confidence in that judgment. So let's say watch. If you really think it was on the list, then give it a seven. If you really think it wasn't, give it a, a, a one. If you're not sure, give it a four. But now you have five and six and two and three to say how confident 
you are that it wasn't or it was. Do you get it? So f seven confident it was, one confident it wasn't, everything else in between. So what I would like you to do right now is to, so, okay, I I'll tell you. In a second, I'm going to ask you to pause it and, and go answer those questions. I will find some way of reflecting back to you what the answers of the class are um, as we go through. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know how I'm going to do that yet, <laughs> but I will. I should have a way of reflecting it, uh, taking a picture and, and pasting it in right under here. So you might have to, if, if you're curious what other people's answers are after you watch this lecture, you might want to come back every now and then and, and see if I've posted an image that shows what people's answers are. Okay, so for now, pause, answer those four questions, please, and then come back. I'll have a drink of tea. Alrighty, you're back. Cool, cool. What's going on? What's Jordan's up to? This is really cool when it works, and, and I don't know if it'll work in this sort of digital way. Um, it's, it's fun when we're all together, and you can see people's hands, and when you can see people's reactions, and the, and the stir it causes. Um, it's going to be a little different online, but here we go. Uh, pause and answer, please. Right, there we go. Oh, <laughs> where's my part with the end? Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. So I usually have a thing I go through. We can get through this, no problem. So let's let's look at each of these. Um, was watch on the list, was candle on the list? Um, you're gonna see that for these, the answer is for watch, no it was not. Okay, see what you think. And for candle, yes it was. Okay, now, these are the ones we really care about. In both cases, in both cases, they were not on the list. And in both cases, chances are high that you said they were. And not only that you said they were, but that you said they were with pretty high confidence. So if you come back, I think you'll see that answers three and four, we're seeing a whole bunch of confident yeses. Um, but it was not on the list. You don't believe me, do you? Well, okay. So remember, watch candle, bed needle. Is going so watch is not, candle is, bed or needle. Go ahead, find them. And just so you know, you know, this was the first slide. I'm not, not, up to any, not up to anything fancy. If you did take a picture of this, you can now look at your picture to confirm. What the heck is going on? Again, you know, it's nice when it's in a class and you see the hands of the people that were very confident for bed and needle because there's always a lot. Uh, and I know some of you were. In fact, when I do this with judges, usually about 40 to 50% of them um, for each of those words are highly confident yeses. And imagine being a judge and then being shown this and being told, you know, you remember something that did not happen. Um, it, that those words were not here. Now, is this a trick? Yes, it's a trick. Sort of a trick. It's a very specific paradigm. You'll hear about it at the end of the textbook called the DRM. I wanted to do it to you before you heard about it. Um, there's a long history to the DRM uh, around false memory and, and courtroom situations. If you want to know that history, I say come to office hours. We'll, we'll talk about um, some of the history of this. But here's the technique that emerged from it. What they did is they came up with words like bed and needle. And they did two steps. So step one is with one group of people, you just say to them, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say the word bed? And well, what do they say? They say things like sleep. Pillow, dream, night, sheet, mattress, tired, blanket. These are all what we call prime associates of the word bed. So we didn't show the word bed, but we showed a bunch of words related to bed. Same idea with needle. What's the first word that comes to mind when I say needle? Tetanus, stitches, cactus, thimble, yarn shot, thread, pierce, okay, all related to the word needle. So that's what we did. We presented something, these things, they went into your memory, and then when we asked to pull them out, we used the word bed. 
And did bed fit with this? Well, again, remember the memory trace is imperfect. It only gets some of it um, back and it kind of fills in the gaps. And when you're asking, did bread, does, does it seem like bread was there? You're like, yeah, that feels actually really good. That from the bits I can remember, they're really beddish and they're really needlish. Um, and so we've tricked your memory uh, into thinking those words were there because there was a bunch of words related to it. And if any of those got retrieved, they kind of strengthened the power or the, or the confidence that bed might have been there. And so we can make people in the right conditions remember things occurring with a high degree of confidence when they're wrong. And that's called false memory. So it's also called the false memory paradigm. Let me just catch up to where I was. And again, you can see I'm not playing any tricks on you because here we are. Yeah. So how does that happen and what does it say about memory? Uh, so again, for, first of all, I hope you come back now and then and see those answers, especially to three and four, see how many of your classmates are, are picking those and, and with how much confidence. I'll try to show those for you. Um, but now let's talk about this in more general, generally. We sometimes are tempted to think of our memory as like a, like a camera on our phone or, you know, a video camera or something where, where, where little pictures are in our mind or little videos are in our mind that we can replay. Now, by that notion, every time you replay, you're replaying the same thing, right? Like, like imagine it's like a song on, on your, on your um, device. You know, every time you play that song, it's the same song. It's exactly the same song. You are getting an image of it that's complete and 100% accurate, and that's what you're playing. And you're, not, and you're not storing what you played afterwards either. You're just retrieving the same file every time. Memory is not like that, okay? Memory retrieves an imperfect file and reconstructs it and then saves that new version. Um, and, and that means memory is constantly changing and evolving with every retrieval. How do we know this? We started with the work of Sir Frederick Bartlett. Um, Sir Bartlett was a, a British uh, professor he was interested in memory. He was known for a few things. Um, so one of them I'll tell you that you can look into further if you want is um, his first little memory test. And so he rode his bicycle all the time um, to the campus and such. And he knew a lot of people and he would often stop and talk to them along the way. And so at some point he decided, I'm going to find this, this odd story. It's called The War of the Ghosts. You can find it online. Um, it's, it's a Native American tale um, about two um, two Indians who are invited to go and, and have a war with ghosts uh, in this weird spiritual canoe uh, and they go and they come back and they tell the story and one of them falls down and dies and so, so it's a very weird story because it's told in in Native American storytelling ways and so it's not weird to them of course but it was weird to the British people that Bartlett read the story too but he read them the story and then on occasion he would stop them and ask them to tell him the story back. And what he found was that when you do this, people get the gist of the story, the main actions that happen, the plot, if you will, you know, they remember that and they remember the characters reasonably well. But when it comes to the details, they change them like crazy. Um, in fact, what they tend to do is very consistent. They, they do something called normalizing, which means they kind of think of it the way they normally think of things. So from their British Christian perspective, um, as, they're, as they're remembering uh, a, a, a tale from Native American uh, spirituality, you know, that represents a Native American spirituality, they don't understand that spirituality. They can sense that it's about spirituality. And then they have their own spirituality that they kind of impose and replace it with. And so suddenly these Indians become more Christianized, so to speak. And they become more Britishized in general. Um, you know, they, they, the people kind of understand the story or the details of the story in terms of details they understand. And they kind of replace the oddities to make it more like what they know. And we call that normalizing. And so remember, you know, top-down processes on perception. What we're saying here is we're bringing in that information from, from memory, but then this sort of normalization is happening, again, to make sense. 
out of the memory. And so that the memory you ultimately get is not the original event. You know, it was not, you don't, you don't hear Bartlett reading you the story. There is no recording of that. You just have some details that seem to be you know, most related to gist. Or, so, or some core points, I should say, which are most related to gist. And then the details all get replaced with normalization stuff. It's sort of the top-down process happening on long-term memory now. Here's uh, another thing Bartlett did to kind of show this uh, happening. So he would, um, he started with this drawing, uh, a sort of owl thing. And he would show it to one person and he would say, okay, um, just remember that. And then maybe a day later, that person would draw what they saw. And so they drew this. Um, and then they would give that to another person. And a day later, that person would draw what they saw. And they did this. And so what we're seeing across people is memory evolving, the memory changing for what's out there. Every person in the way. And at some point, somewhere around here, something critical happens well not critical but kind of interesting this thing becomes this thing that was sort of owl like still becomes a cat especially somewhere in this trail here and we get cat like features cat is a more normal and common animal than an owl um, and so we're seeing this sort of normalization um, get put in place for this and now it's almost like a dog here um, so again, kind of, just kind of an interesting depiction to watch memory as it changes with each recounting. It's also kind of creepy, don't you think? <laughs> Do you think Drake took psychology? He should, shouldn't he? If he didn't, he should take my class. Anybody know Drake? Tell him to take my class. Almost like nailed the second, almost nailed this one. Very cool. <laughs> Just thought I'd throw that out there for your amusement. Um, let me tell you one of the other cool uh, areas where, where this has had a big impact, and that's in the courtroom. So Elizabeth Loftus is um, just a very, very well-known psychologist who specializes in memory in courtroom kind of settings. Um, and it's because of her that a lot of the rules in the courtroom are what they are. Um, so let me tell you about a study she did. She had people watch a little video uh, in which one car contacted another car, I'll say contacted for now, contacted another car. Um, and so they watched that video at one point and then they did other things and blah, blah, blah. And then at some point, um, Loftus brought them back to that video. She said, you remember that video I showed you? I have a question for you. And then she asked, you know, five different questions to five different groups. Uh, and all she changed was the verb. So in one group, she said, how fast was that first car going when it contacted the second one? And for the second group, how fast was that first car going when it hit the second one? How fast was that first car going when it bumped into the second one? How fast was that first car going when it collided with the second one? And how fast was that first car going when it smashed into the second one? Depending on the verb she used, their estimate of speed crept up. If you use a dramatic verb, they're seeing it as a more dramatic, they're remembering it as a more dramatic incident. Remember, when you're pulling things out of out of um, long-term memory, you're using what's ever in working memory. That's the cue that you fish it out with, right? And what she's saying is a lawyer, by using a different verb, that's what's in your head. That's the question they ask. That's what you use to fish out a memory. And she's saying when you use a more dramatic verb, they're going to fish out or they're going to reconstruct a more dramatic version of the accident. So you can systematically manipulate the memory people are forming. Now, some people said, well, hang on. How do we know this isn't just some bias? How do you know it's really the memory that they're forming? Well, she said she did a second thing too. She asked each of them. Was there any broken glass at the scene um, after the accident? And um, there wasn't, by the way. Um, now, when she asks this, let's go to the, the control group. This was a different study, so she just has the two words, but you get the idea. With the control group, this is just sort of a false alarm, right? Right. Even six of those said that they saw broken glass. They, they remembered there being broken glass, so memory is certainly imperfect. Um, when you use the word hit, then in this group, seven, 
so there's 50 in each of these groups and this group seven said that they saw a broken glass but here's the word smashed when you use the word smashed 16 say they remember seeing broken glass so this is suggesting they are indeed bringing to mind a more dramatic version of the accident the more you study memory, the less you trust it <laughs> because you start to see things like this um, that can happen. And they really show that memory is very dynamic. It's, it's a very dynamic process um, and it's constantly recreating previous memories and then storing those recreated versions. And therefore, the memory is evolving and changing in systematic ways. Um, crazy, huh? You want crazy? I'll give you crazy. Um, here's here's um, uh, a story from Australia, and it's 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 yeah. Anyway, here's here's how the story goes. There was a, a woman alone in her apartment, um, had the TV on, was doing housework, uh, an assailant broke in uh, and and sexually assaulted her and attacked her. Um, the police came afterwards, and she talked to the police officer, and and they said, "Hey, did you did you see this assailant?" And she said, "Yeah, I saw him." Uh, and he said, well, if I brought in a sketch artist, could, could you help the sketch artist to, to draw uh, the assailant's face? And she said, yeah, sure, yeah. Uh, and so they brought in the sketch artist, did a bunch of work with her, um, came up with a really good rendition similar to this guy, a guy named Donald Thompson. He was actually a psychologist, a local psychologist and a memory expert. Um, people knew of him. And so it was pretty easy once they had the sketch to track him down. Uh, so then they tracked him down and they said, Hey, you know, we've got the situation and where were you at this time and on that day? And he said, Oh, I was being interviewed on that time, live television. And they said, Oh, really? Oh, that's a pretty good alibi. You were on live television. Then you weren't in her apartment or were you? She had the television on. She had it on the channel that he was on. She had seen his face and she was then attacked. And somehow in her memory, his face got stuck to the assailant. Those two things got connected. When she recreated that memory, that's the face she saw. She wasn't lying. That's how she experienced the memory. Um, but that's the kind of thing memory can do when it tries to make sense, when it wants badly to make sense um, of something, it can do things like that. So it's really the same story with memory as it is for perception. It starts with this noisy input, except this time it's coming from long-term memory. And through top-down processes, it relies on past experiences and other things to normalize and to recreate the memory, which it then stores again, allowing for these memories to continually evolve. So I wanted to just wrap everything up now by kind of coming to, to clinical hypnosis and just connecting some of these things we talked about. So remember when I talked about clinical hypnosis before, I said, okay, it's not all that silliness that you see on stage things. What it involves is really allowing somebody to get into a very relaxed state. And now let's be geeks again. It seems like when they're in that really relaxed state, that their visual spatial scratch pad, that part of us that allows us to imagine things, becomes very um, good at producing vivid images. Um, it's almost like, you know, a dream sort of image that we've talked about. You can get into that state where you can have very, very vivid images in your mind. And I said, okay, so now the, the clinician will use that. That's the critical aspect of hypnosis right there. The visual, the, the visual acuity, the heightened ability. And you can use that sort of in a virtual reality way. Um, and so the classic example that I gave you is, you know, imagine somebody's coming to, to quit smoking. That's what you're trying to um, do with hypnosis. Um, I'm going to give you my example again, but I I'm going to be able to tie it to a bunch of things. And you'll see now why it could be so powerful. So for this person, you might say, okay, you've got them in a hypnotic trance. They're there. And say, imagine you're in the favorite place where you are, where you like to smoke. Um, so imagine yourself in that place. But in that place, there's an ashtray, of course. Um, you haven't cleaned the ashtray uh, for very long. It's kind of dirty and gross and you know how ashtrays can get. Um, okay, but now, you know, as, as, you're, um, as you're about to have a drag off a cigarette, you have this compulsion now. It seems like there's this connection. You have to do this, which is every time you take a drag off the cigarette, you have to lick that dirty ashtray. 
maybe even take some of the butts in your mouth for a while. And it's a bit about, pfft, pfft. okay. So heightened imagery, that's probably gross for you guys with just this, but imagine really heightened deep imagery and you have these cigarette butts and gross stuff in your mouth and the feeling it would have on your teeth. And then you spit that out, but they're still on your teeth and you can never get that flavor out. What's the therapist doing? Uh, well, it's classical conditioning, right? Let's let's make that cigarette predict disgust. Well, why disgust? Why that blah, blah, blah? Mmm, taste aversion, single trial learning, very, very powerful. So they're trying to create a sort of taste aversion connection, classical conditioning, using the heightened imagery from the visual spatial scratch pad in the person's working memory to give them this experience, to do conditioning. Um, but you know, it's Pavlovian conditioning, but it can be done in this way and the vivid imagery helps. So see how now suddenly you're, we're seeing a lot of these things you're learning about um, can fit together in a consideration of something like clinical hypnosis, which I think is kind of cool. And therefore I'm going to stop this lecture there. See you guys, uh, by the way, we're in this together. We will get through it together. Good days are ahead. Alrighty, later guys, bye-bye.